weird when people ask me anything about my career, as though I've ever had a career. I mean, I kind of career from one thing to another. I, um, I, I got obsessed with the paranormal because of an experience that I had back in 1970. And that made me absolutely convinced of the reality of all kinds of paranormal phenomena. And I decided I would devote my life to parapsychology. But after a, well, less than 10 years, really, I come to the conclusion that it was a waste of time. If there are any paranormal phenomena, which I doubt, but there could be, I wasn't going to find them. So I gave that up. And then I became more interested in weird experiences because I'd had these experiences and if you can't explain them in terms of telepathy and clairvoyance and whatever, then how can they be explained? So, and that got me into the really deep questions about consciousness and what it means to be aware at all with its big philosophical and neuroscientific problems. How I got into memes is, is very odd indeed. I mean, in the midst of that, you might have thought there was some logic to that. And this is not having jobs. I mean, I ne <clears throat> very rarely had a proper job at all. But what happened was, I was working too hard and got very ill, and I had chronic fatigue, and I was in bed for nearly a year. And during that time, a student of mine wrote an essay about consciousness and means. And Darwin's Dangerous Idea, Dan Dennett's book, had just come out then. And I started reading that. Because I was so ill, it took me three months to read that book. And that made me then reread The Selfish Gene, in which the idea of memes was coined by Richard Dawkins. So after about six months, I'd managed to read two books, being in bed all day for six months, I managed to read two books. I was full of ideas of memes, and that's why I wrote The Meme Machine, and that's how I got, got into it. Excellent. You can see that's not really a career, can't you? <laughs> I've been really lucky that I've been able to follow the ideas that I loved. And I've been a freelance most of my life, which of course is very unpredictable in terms of money and security, but I've always preferred that um, to having to do the sort of things you have to do when you have a job. Uh, I go to meetings, fill in forms to deal with other people. I just like to work all by myself at home. And I get a lot more work done that way. I could say something rather controversial, yeah. that I think living the kind of life that I have has been easier for a woman than it would be for a man. I did not have the pressure of having to earn enough money to support the family. Um, I had to, or wanted certainly, to earn a reasonable contribution to the family income, but I wasn't the kind of ever the one that everyone had to rely on. And I've had men supporting me, my father to begin with, and my husband, and I want to be grateful for that, that has made it easier for me to follow the ideas that I loved. I should explain the relationship between genes and memes. In Richard Dawkins' um, book, The Selfish Gene, what he was trying to do was to explain the principle of universal Darwinism. The idea that, I mean, Darwin's amazingly brilliant idea, <laughs> which is so obvious when you get it, but it's actually quite hard to get which is that if you have any kind of information that is copied, multiple copies made, and then selected, very few of the copies survive, and then the very few things that survive pass on whatever it was that helped them survive to the next generation, then you get design out, apparently out of nowhere. Um, design created by death, designed by death, I would call it. Now, at the end of that book, Dawkins said, this idea is not confined to genes. We need to understand biology, we need to understand Darwinism, that Darwinian process. But it would apply to any information anywhere in the universe. That was his claim, and, and I would agree with him. So at the end of the book he says, well, are there any other replicators on this planet? And he looks around and goes, yeah, here all around us, these, our culture, the things we've created, these have been created by the same process copying and variation and selection. So these windows, you know, the idea of windows started somewhere, and people copied it, and now we have amazing plate glass and, and toughened glass and every other kind of glass. Um, but these things are there because they were the winners in the competition to get people to copy them. And that's the idea of, of memes. So memes use, human beings were created um, by, by genetic and biological evolution, 
and they give rise to memes, which is then cultural evolution. So memetics is one way of explaining or of describing cultural evolution. The wonderful thing about the idea of universal Darwinism is that potentially you might be able to apply it to all kinds of design, and lots of people are doing that. I mean, this goes back quite a long way. Certainly Darwin talked about languages, which is more like memes, but there are other people who've talked about um, the selection of crystals in the early planet Earth, that you would get some kind of copying. It's not quite copying the variation and selection, but you get copying um, the spreading of, of, of crystalline forms, shapes, and so on. Um, and then, of course, some do survive and, uh, and others don't. Um, people have applied it even down at the um, uh, subatomic particles level to possibly there are Darwinian processes going on there. I'm not a physicist and I'm not really competent to judge that. But the idea that, that all design in the universe has come over, about by this same process is very tempting to explore. So although my interest is in exploring it in terms of human means and technological means in computers and so on, I'm really pleased there are other people doing the physics end and, and perhaps you know, well before life how the, 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 the um, form and structure on our planet came about by some kind of scientific process. There are several people talking about universal Darwinism in physics. I think Lee Smolin is talking about the origins of, of universes but Howard Bloom is talking about analogies between um, star structures forming um, and biological processes, and shows pictures of them looking very similar. Um, he calls it the Xerox effect. And this is the importance of copying. None of these things work unless you copy information. And what's really fascinating is matter, the, there's only so much you know, conservation of matter, but information keeps on multiplying. You copy something, and you vary and select and vary and select, keep copying, you get more information. It's kind of magical in a way, based on the same matter and energy in the universe, but information is, is flowering, and this is, given, this is all about universal darkness and giving rise to new information. People get terribly confused by the idea of memes. The basic definition of a meme is that which is imitated. This is, I'm going right back to Dawkins, and other people go off in all kinds of other directions, but for me, I stick to the original idea. Information that is copied with variation and selection. So a meme is something that's imitated from person to person, or copied in some kind of way from person to person. So when people say to me, oh, well, there's no point in memetics, it's just the same as ideas. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, ideas become memes when they are copied from one person to another. If you have an idea all by yourself and never tell anybody about it, it's just an idea, it's not a meme. Now, not all memes are ideas. For example, um, uh, well, I suppose something like driving on the left or eating with a knife and fork in a sense is an idea, but it's the behavior that is copied. Um, and there are many other, other things that we do, physical activities that we do, which um, we, we learn memetically, but they aren't ideas, they're actions. So memes cover um, ways of making things, ways of doing things, actions, words, stories, uh, songs. Is a song an idea? Well, not exactly, is it? It's a song, and that's what that's what gets copied. So that's a not very helpful criticism that people make all the time. There are so many criticisms of memetics, and I I wonder why. Some of them are are constructive criticisms. For example. Um, that a lot of um, meme transmission, if you like, is more reproduction than, than true imitation. And that's something that we can investigate. But other, other criticisms, oh, it's Lamarckian and we know that doesn't work, all, all, all sorts of criticisms. I, I wonder why people just hate the idea. And I have many theories about this, but that's all they are, or perhaps I should say speculations, that for some people, the whole idea of memetics seems to undermine human autonomy. Well, yeah, right, it should, because we're all interrelated. We're, everything's interconnected. We're not autonomous, completely separated things. The fact that we're taking in memes from other people and spreading them out again, that's what we do. I don't find that scary, but some people do. There are other reasons, um, I think, to do with the fact that biologists can sometimes get quite upset at the idea that 
Darwinian theory is being used in this, as they would see it, unfair way. <coughs> they want to keep it for, for biology, which I can understand, but it's not very helpful. And then at the other end, you have um, social scientists who don't want any kind of Darwinian argument um, to intrude on um, history and economics, um, sociology, and so on. So there are all these kind of forces against it. What we need is really good predictions made from mean theory that wouldn't be made from any other theory and turn out to be right. And so far, we don't have such. <laughs> so maybe I should say, ah, give up on this, it's useless. But I don't because the way the world is changing now looks to me exactly what I would expect from genetics. And I'm also comforted by the idea that it took a very, very long time for Darwin's ideas to be um, turned into empirically testable ideas. I suspect that in the future we will find some critical ways in which mean theory is the only or the best way of explaining them. But certainly we don't have that yet. So I'm quite open to the possibility that the whole idea and the whole years I've devoted to thinking about it are, are a waste of time. I don't, I don't think so, but it's possible. All the time that I've been working on memes, I've, it's been bothering me thinking about whether all the information flowing around in our phones and computers and so on is really just more memes or is actually something new and different. And if we go back, I don't know, 15, 20 years when I was first interested in, in memes, there wasn't that much. I mean, the, the, the World Wide Web was brand new and, you know, I didn't have a clue that it would turn out the way it is now. So as these years have gone on, I thought the question has become clearer in my mind. Is all this digital information in silicon-based machinery more memes or something different? So I thought to myself, could it be a third replicator? Because if genes are the first replicator, um, as Dawkins would put it, and memes are the second replicator, building on a product of the first, could there be a third replicator building on a product of the second? Yes, that product of the second, in other words, a product of our memes, is computers, phones, servers, all that machinery. And here we are busily producing more and more of it. And the kind of information that's copied, um, digital images, words, all of these kinds of things, in digital form, is quite different from me speaking now, where it's coming out of my mouth, you hear it, you pass it on or not. Um, or maybe somebody watching this say, oh, do you know, she said this, you know. But it's very different from the actual um, digital form, which is going to be copied over presumably numerous um, silicon-based machines. Thinking about it that way, I then asked myself, well, to count as a new replicator, it would have to be that all three processes required for a Darwinian evolution are happening in that machinery. That is copying, varying, selecting. Now, 20 years ago, I wasn't so sure that that was happening outside of human intervention, but now it certainly is. I mean, if you look at the things that Amazon's doing, or Google, or, or the ent entities, if you can call them that, like Siri and Alexa and so on, um, there are there's software there that is doing all the copying and varying and selecting without a human interference. Now, we're still necessary. Uh, we put in the search terms that, that we want. We buy things um, in online shopping, and that gives data to all, all the software. So we're still part of it. We're also building the machinery and digging up the oil and the gas and everything. But we are not in charge in the same way that we are involved with ordinary human beings. So I am convinced that if the idea of multiple replicators is true at all, we have let loose in the last 20 years or so a third level of replicators. And this is really important because replicators have design power. They have replicator power in Dawkins' terms. The power to create new things. And if that's happening out of our control, we should start to understand just what's going on. And I don't think we do. If there is a third replicator, as I suspect there is, we need a new name for it. I really struggled with that. I called it teams to begin with, and then people thought I was talking about football or something. So I put an, um, 
uh, a request in the New Scientist magazine and asked people to send in names. And I got, I think, 23 different names and hardly any repetitions. So there wasn't any good name that came out. So I changed it to Trings on that try three, you know, third replicator. Uh, maybe that's a better meme and will spread more. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll just fizzle out and get forgotten. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah. People often ask me whether I have any favorite internet memes. Oh, I should say, by the way, that internet memes are only one small category of memes. Um, but of course, the phenomenon of internet memes has made the word meme be a much more successful meme. Um, some of the early ones, I, I was absolutely besotted with Ceiling Cat. I loved the fact that, it, that Ceiling Cat was so obviously like God. Uh, the idea of something's looking down it. And I love the way you could look up, look, oh, it's closed over again, the ceiling cat was looking, but the ceiling shut again. I made my own ceiling cat pictures and uh, laughed a lot about it. Still, uh, every so often I think, Ooh, ceiling cat watching. I love the way that ceiling cat morphed, as memes will do, into um, uh, all sorts of new elaborated forms. So it became ceiling cat and basement cat. And that became, you know, heaven and hell and angels and devils and, and what have you. And that gave people the opportunity to produce all kinds of wonderful new images. And in a way, although internet memes are just a tiny, tiny fraction of all the memes, they, they display so very obviously the fact that people can very easily copy, very select. Well, they copy and vary things, hope that theirs will get selected, and then mostly it doesn't. And it shows up so well, the selection crashes, which force a very few images or phrases or whatever it is, um, uh, you know, can ask cheeseburger, um, that sort of thing. And it's so hard to know why, but once it's got going, you can see the way, the way it carries on. If you think about memes as just information sitting somewhere, then it's not going to really do anything. But once that information is taking part in an evolutionary process, then it takes on some kind of agency or some kind of power. Richard Dawkins calls it replicator power. It is the power to produce design out of nowhere. So even with something you know, trivial internet memes, you can see how with different people passing on some and not others, you end up with, with more and more uh, interesting variations than you started out with. And of course that happens with you know, all the things around us, you know, furniture and cars and clothes and, and all of these things. Um, by their very existence, the fact that the world fills up with the successful memes and the ones that nobody wants to copy disappear means that's what replicator power is about. The evolutionary process producing new design. To that extent, I would say that that memes have agency, but it isn't really the memes, it's the entire process. It is it's that process of the information being stored, copied, buried, selected. That's where the, the power comes from. Okay. It's interesting to think that most of what we know is mimetic. Not everything. I know how to do things I've learned for myself with my own physical body that are not memes. But every word in my language is a meme. I didn't invent it. I could have, yeah, I invented the word tree. <laughs> but otherwise, and all the, the stories I know, I can elaborate them, I can bring in other memes and so on. But essentially, human knowledge is mostly because of memetic processes. It's because we share things. Other species don't do that. There are cultures in other species to the extent that, for example, certain groups of chimpanzees will fish for termites in a certain way and other groups do it differently or use more sponges to get water out of small holes. The, these kinds of things and some other species too. But we, we alone on this planet are really good at imitation. Little kids start imitating very young and imitation is the fundamental process required. It's the copying that makes it possible for us to, um, to, ha to have culture at all. I think people underestimate that. I think because imitation comes so easily to us, we just do it all the time, <laughs> just copy people, other people that we're with. We think it must be easy, and it isn't. Computationally, imitation is a really demanding task. And for this reason, uh, there are not many species who do it. I have gone so far as to say that 
in the great question, what makes us human, and why are humans unique? My answer is, we are unique because we are so good at imitation. We alone have let loose a second replicator means, and are in the process of letting loose a third replicator of troops. And all that comes down to that one ability. What I would really like is that some really good um, evolutionary biologists would weigh in on the whole meme concept and the trains as well and apply evolutionary principles that I'm not an expert on to these fields and out of that get some testable predictions and from that get the ability perhaps to understand better um, what's going on at the moment in, in the world of AI. Uh, sadly, most biologists think that the whole idea of memes is rubbish and so this it might still happen. So if there are any of you out there, please, um, please come and help me think about these ideas.